We're going to start off this final session with a look at Latin America. I'm talking about Latin America as a foreign direct investment hotspot for Chinese firms, about the opportunities that that continent presents and also the risks. And to do that, um, we're joined today by Irene Mao. Um, she's the regional director for our Latin American and Caribbean analysis team based in London. Um, prior to working for us in that particular role, she worked as a senior economist and director for the Centre for Global Competitiveness and Performance at the World Economic Forum, and she was responsible for a number of issues around national competitiveness and development. Um, also the editor of Global Information Technology Report for six years, which is one of the flagship publications at the WEF. Um, before that, she worked for an investment bank in Paris. Um, her research expertise covers a whole range of topics from development and international trade to innovation and ICT competitiveness. Um, she has an MA in Latin American Studies and a PhD in International Economics and Trade Law. Um, so with that, um, Irina, if you could tell us about Latin America. Good afternoon. Thanks for staying with us after the break. I will try to keep you entertained for the next, for the next 25 minutes. So um, I have too many things in my hands. Latin America and China is actually a, for Latin America, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite an interesting relationship. It's a bit of an incipient relationship because China is not a traditional partner for the region, but it's becoming one of the major, especially for some of the commodity exporter countries. Um, what I try to do in this, in this 25 minutes I have allocated is really to give you a general idea of the potential of Latin America as, a, as an investment destination and also as a trade partner. Um, here in the first slide you have uh, a couple of points, a couple of important points and, uh, and um, uh, advantages for Latin America when it comes to FDI. Uh, so it's actually the slide that you can, I mean, I've, I, will, I, will, I will go through all those points during my presentation, but basically what I wanted really to point out is that the region, which used to be quite unstable financially and, uh, and political until 20 years ago, is now, has actually come a long way from that situation, is now a, count, a, a, a region which by and large is growing quite steadily uh, with, uh, with very sound macroeconomic fundamentals. It's also a combined market of around 6 million people, which, of course, compared to China, is small, but you know, in, in terms of general markets and general, uh, general dimension, it's, it's quite a big mar market. Uh, what also we have been uh, seeing in the, last, in the last 10 years or so has been really uh, the emergence of the, of the con consumer market in the region. So this has been actually been possible, and it has, it has gone hand in hand with uh, very, a lot of progress towards reducing poverty um, and really um, increasing the purchasing power of more and more people in the region. Also, the region is uh, something which, which has actually attracted China attention so far. It's actually abundant in uh, strategic natural resources. Uh, and in fact, most of the Chinese investment in Latin America at the moment are concentrating in the, in the commodities and, and mining sector. Um, it is a strategic location as well because not only uh, it has uh, access to the obviously to their neighbor to the to the US, uh, some of the countries have free trade access to the to the US, but also it's a it's a it's a region which has it is quite uh, um, open towards the the rest of the world and it's linked to three or four continents by a separate um, network of trade agreements. So it's actually int interesting because if you enter into one of the countries in Latin America, you don't, you don't have just access to, the, to its domestic market, rather also to the markets of the countries which are partner in trade agreement with, uh, with that. With that. Um, for uh, for um, Chinese standards as well, FDI inflows to the region are not so high, but they are record high for Latin American standards. We are forecasting actually for 2017 um, 220 more or less uh, billion of FDI to the region uh, in total. So in terms of growth rates for Latin America, um, this year we are expecting a general growth rate, we take the average for the region of 3.6, and then for the rest of the forecast period in the next four, e four years, we are looking at a growth rate around, three per around 4%, which is actually quite good in, uh, in historical terms. Again, 
when, when one comes to China, it's actually it's not an impressive rate, but it is if we look at the, at the, at the past for Latin America, which has been subject to uh, recurrent crisis and, uh, and, uh, and recessions. Um, last year, what we have seen in Latin America, we have seen a growth rate of 3% overall, which has been a bit of a, a slowdown with respect to the, to, the, to the year before. But in any case, we see that as a, a cyclical slowdown rather than a structural problem there. And we think that the region is going to continue to grow, sustained by some macro, macroeconomic policies, um, resilient domestic demand, and a modest pickup in general condition. The recovery in China will also benefit, obviously, the commodities exporter in, uh, in the region. Um, one little problem with Latin America is the widening current account deficit we have been seeing in the last, in the last uh, few years, which is something that is kind of increasing the vulnerability of the region to shift in market sentiments. But then again, the region is actually quite uh, uh, protected by those, uh, those uh, shifts in market sentiment by a, by a large stock of, uh, of foreign reserves. And of, in general, overall macroeconomic, uh, um, very sound macroeconomic indicators. Looking at the relationship so far with China, actually, is a very, is a, as, a, as I was saying in the beginning, is quite a recent relationship. China has increased its share of, in Latin American trade from 1% in the 80s to 11% in 2011, and is now the third largest trading partners for, the, for Latin America after the US and the, and the European Union, which are the two traditional um, um, markets for the region. Um, also, China has become a very important investor in the, in the region. Uh, looking at the data for 2010, China was the third investor in the region. In 2011, uh, uh, its shares went, went a bit down. But what is important is really to point out the trend in, increase, in increasing um, FDI from China in Latin America. At the moment, mostly, as I was saying, in extraction and natural resources, but also we are seeing that uh, Chinese investment is also diversifying in infrastructure and manufacturers, especially in Brazil, where there is a, there is a very important, a very interesting domestic market per se and where there are uh, requirements of local content to actually be able to import in the, in the domestic market. Also, China is, a, is one of an, incre the incre an increasing source of funding for the region. Um, there was a study last year that found that uh, Chinese bank had lent to the region uh, from 2005 to 2012 something like $75 billion, uh, which is more than Exim Bank and, uh, and the Inter-American Development Bank uh, funding pro uh, combined in, uh, during this period. So it's really some f a pattern which is really important for Latin America. There are some challenges which we will see um, in, the, in the course of the presentation, but it is a very good, a very, it is a very solid base uh, uh, from where to build. The opportunities. Um, so in terms of a size of the market in Latin America, you see that the, gen, the, the combined market in Latin America is around, as I was saying in the beginning of the presentation, six, 600 uh, million people. You have markets in, in themselves which are really interesting, like Brazil and Mexico, which are the two giants in the regions, but also very, very dynamic economies like the Andean, uh, Colombia, Argentina, and Peru. Uh, which in themselves represent very important domestic markets with a population which, is actu which actually has an increased uh, uh, purchasing power, as we will see in the next slide. Um, what has been one of the most interesting um, de developments we have seen in, uh, in past years in, in Latin America has been really the ri rise of a middle class, um, which has been quite dramatic, because if you just look at Brazil from 2003 to 2011, something like 62 million people have, have been lifted to the middle class rank, which is more or less the population of Spain. So it's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite striking when you, one looks at that uh, in terms of success story in uh, reducing poverty and uh, uh, increasing opportunities for the population in those, uh, in those regions. How has been this, this has been achieved actually through, obviously, uh, uh, greater economic stability and economic growth, but also increases in, in uh, minimum wages and, very important, conditional tran cash transfer programs which have been um, pioneered in Latin America and have been extremely successful. Uh, they have reached uh, around 110 million people in the region um, and they have really contributed to the falling of, the, of income inequality in, in the region. Um, uh, what I put in my, the, the, the Gini uh, index, which is a, a measure of income inequality, has been falling steadily in the region. It's still quite high compared to other uh, regions of the world, but nevertheless, 
there have been quite a lot of progress in that respect. 41 million and uh, 18 million, respectively, have been lifted out of poverty and extreme poverty in the last 10 years in, uh, in Latin America. Also, it's a very young population with respect to developing countries, but also to some, um, sorry, to developed countries, but also to some developing countries. In Brazil, the average age is less than 30 years old, and 30% are 14 years or younger. So this is something quite interesting because it's obviously for the, for, the, for the potential going forward. Also the urbanization rate is up. So as you can see, there is actually a, domestic a thriving domestic market, which is actually an opportunity by itself. If you look at the private cons consumption per head, and our forecast for 2013 and 2017, you see that it's quite interesting because if you look at uh, Brazil or Mexico, the private consumption per head is much higher than the one of India or China or uh, um, even Peru and Colombia. But what I wanted to stress is that it's actually, uh, in terms of, uh, of general size and general GDP, Latin America is uh, smaller than China, but in terms of purchasing power and consumer power in each of those countries, it's quite high. The, the, the other element which is interesting when one thinks about uh, uh, settling in Latin America or you know, having access to the Latin American markets is that Latin America has, has changed quite a lot in terms of trade policy with respect uh, to 20, uh, 30 years ago. It is now, with some exception obviously, a very open region to the rest of the world. Um, to the rest of the world and also internally, the region is actually integrated by a, by a series of trade agreements, Mercosur in the southern corner of Latin America, the Indian community, the, the Pacific Alliance, which is actually a very interesting um, new type of agreement uh, putting together um, the Pacific countries of, uh, of Latin America, Mexico, Chile, uh, Colombia and Peru, which tried really to develop a, a, a sort of regional value chain, but also to project towards Asia, because that's also their, their kind of natural partner. Um, also, as I was saying, it's not just internally, the region is also projecting towards the rest of the world. Not, the US, obviously, is the, is the main market, and it's also integrated through NAFTA with Mexico and, uh, and Canada. But there's also the CAFTA DR, which is a trade agreement with Central America and, and Dominican Republic. And also the US has, uh, has signed last year agreement with Chile, Colombia, and Panama. So it's really a very, a very, it's really integrated into, in, especially Mexico, Mexico in, the, in the global value chain of the US. Uh, the other, the other uh, projection is toward Asia. Uh, not only is most of the countries of the region, of the Pacific one, are part of APEC, but also to the, to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is a, a, a new generation trade agreement uh, uh, which is now being negotiated. And I would say, as I was saying, Chile, Peru and Mexico are also uh, part of this um, Pacific Alliance and have um, all sorts of bilateral free trade with other countries in, uh, in Asia. Looking at specific, some specific markets, I kind of looked at a more uh, interesting market at the moment. Um, so Brazil is, is actually part of the BRICS. Um, I, even if, as uh, Robin was saying at the beginning of the, of the conference, Brazil has lost some of its shine. Uh, last year it grew at 0.9%, which was the worst performance, uh, the second worst performance after the crisis. Uh, this year we have uh, um, revised uh, downward the forecast already twice, so now we are expecting a growth with 3%, so not really impressive. But it's still a very important and very, a very promising market for, for FDI, just for the size of its market. Um, and also for the opportunity for investors, not, not only in the, in, the, in the strategic natural resources, uh, in the energy and oil, uh, Brazil, it's... Uh, uh, is, well, if, if, the, um, if the auction for the new uh, oil field in the pre-salt uh, um, part of Brazil uh, um, offshore um, in the state of Espiritu Santo, Santa Catalina, are awarded, uh, there is the potential for Brazil to, to increase its, uh, its, um, its reserve to 80 billion barrels. So it's something that it's, uh, it's, um, it's quite important for investors because that's an area where Brazil is actually welcoming FDI uh, in order to explore all these opportunities. Also the agribusiness, it's one of very important, important areas for Brazil, but more in general, if we really look at the, at the, at the FDI, uh, from, the, from an FDI perspective, I would say that the infrastructure is probably the most interesting 
uh, field at the moment, not only Brazil is actually preparing itself to host uh, two major sports events, the, the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics in 2016, but the government actually, as part of its efforts to really reactivate growth and ensure that growth is sustainable going forward, is actually focusing on removing um, bottlenecks to competitiveness in the country. One of the main bottlenecks to competitiveness in the country is, infra is the state of infrastructure. So basically, uh, the government is, is uh, investing very much in infrastructure, is, uh, is courting the private sector to invest in infrastructure, and uh, uh, has uh, recently um, set up a program of uh, 190 billion for private concession in uh, road, railway, sports, and airport up to 2015 to be able to be, to be ready for the Olympics at least. Uh, as we don't know whether they were going to be ready for the World Cup in 2014. So in terms of, uh, of challenges for Brazil going forward, um, it's, it's probably quite similar to China. Now for Brazil, for Brazil to be able to grow to, in a sustained way, it really needs to um, develop productivity increase in the country. So all these areas uh, uh, related to the, what, they call, what we call the, the Brazilian cost, which is the, the, the poor state of infrastructure, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal system, which is, very, um, which is a burden, which is very complicated for, for businesses, uh, ease of doing business, all this area needs to, be, um, needs to be really tackled for Brazil to be able to continue to grow uh, and really fulfill its, uh, its potential. Problem is that elections are next year, and the political scene has already shifted towards the election, so we don't expect uh, the, the government of, uh, of Dilma Rousseff to uh, really make many progress in, with respect to tackling these this, this problems, which, which are more structural and require uh, political and popular um, reforms. Second country I wanted to attract your attention on is Mexico. Uh, Mexico has become now what Brazil was two years ago, so which is good because uh, you know it's good to have a bit of uh, alternance in uh, in uh, in, uh, in the star uh, for FDI. Mexico actually has been uh, is a completely different model from Brazil. Uh, while Brazil has been quite close to foreign uh, for, to foreign involvement and uh, and uh, and. Um, and trade, only 20% of uh, Brazil GDP is, uh, is accounted for trade. Mexico is 60%, export represents 60% of, of the country's GDP. Uh, it, Mexico has followed a, a kind of export-led and very open uh, development um, model in the, past, in the past few years, has become the most, one of the most important lowest cost component manufacturing in the world. It has also a very strategic location, geographical location. Um, North America, to which it is integrated, but also Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, uh, North and South America. Um, it's, uh, it's linked by an extensive network of free trade agreement with over 40 countries in three continents. Um, and actually, in the last few years, it really has uh, adopted uh, most of the macroeconomic reform which, made, which put the country in a very, in a very good footing um, going forward. What, what was missing a little bit in the case of Mexico was actually tackling, as in the case of Brazil, the bottlenecks to competitiveness long-term long growth. Um, what has changed is the new administration of uh, President uh, Enrique Peña Nieto. It's uh, uh, actually, it's his first four months, now four or five months, have been quite uh, striking. Um, I was personally quite pessimistic when the, with the PRI, which is the, gover the, the party which has been at the, at, the, at the power for 60 years uh, before the last 12 years, uh, um, came back to power in Mexico last year. But the president has really been very successful so far in uh, uh, implementing and designing a, a, a structural r um, agenda of reforms and has been very successful in reaching out to the opposition and so far actually very important reform which had been blocked for years, such as the education reform, telecommunication reform, um, um, uh, financial market reform have been adopted, which is quite striking, especially in a, in a country like, uh, like, uh, like Mexico, where in the last 12 years uh, the government couldn't really uh, push through many reforms since the, the opposition was, was being quite ob obstructionist. So we have, uh, we have good... Uh, we have very, very, very positive outlook for Mexico. Um, Mexico is, we, we, now, we now expect Mexico to, to grow at 3.7% in the, in the next uh, five years on average, but there are upside risks actually because telecommunication and energy sectors are sectors that were quite close to competition up to now. 
with the opening of those sectors, which we expect in some form, um, there'll be plenty of opportunity. Only the telecommunication uh, uh, reform is expected to add one percentage point to, uh, to, to GDP growth. So it's, uh, it's quite a promising um, country. And uh, it's probably going to be the next Brazil, at least for the next few years. Well, Brazil and Mexico has, have always been in competition, but it seems that now uh, Mexico is prevailing. Uh, Colombia, it's uh, now going now to the, more, to the, to the smaller market. Uh, Colombia is another success story overall. is the CEO of CIVETS, which is our uh, uh, acronym for the next uh, emerging markets uh, after the BRICS. So it's actually a country which only 10 years ago was, was considered almost a failed state with, with very, very, very serious problem in terms of uh, political stability. There was a civil war um, going on, almost a civil war. And the, the country has really changed completely in, uh, in 10 years. Um, it's one of the most open countries in Latin America. Um, one of the most business friendly countries in Latin America. I focus on, uh, on, um, on infrastructure. Uh, uh, on financial service, on the mining sector, uh, a strong tradition of respect and regulation of, to protect intellectual property. Um, there are new opportunities opening up for foreign investors, particularly in the hydrocarbons and mining, road construction, electricity, and also there is free trade access to the, to the US market. Um, election next year in Colombia, uh, the, main, um, the main hurdle at the moment is the peace talks. There are actually peace talks in, uh, ongoing in, uh, in Cuba between uh, the government and, and the FARC uh, guerrilla. So that's going to be the main stumbling block. If a, uh, if a stable and uh, durable solution to the, to, the, to, the, to the negotiation is found, this is going to be extremely important for Colombia going forward because really that will, would really ensure that the, that the country is stable also on the, from the political point of view, security point of view. Um, I had also Peru, but I just have five minutes, so I would just very, very quickly, Peru is, uh, is another of the, of the, of the Andean uh, tigers. It's actually the country which is, which is expected to have the highest um, growth rate in the next five years. Uh, again, very similar to Colombia, lots of opportunity in mining and um, renewable energy and infrastructure. Um, since I have just five minutes, I just wanted to also uh, look at some of the challenges for the region as such. So, uh, before that, just a quick look at the, at the annual average FDI inflows for, uh, for um, the past five years and the next five years. Uh, you see that the numbers are actually going up, going up quite a lot in 2000, in the average uh, uh, FDI inflows for, from, for 2013 to 2017 is actually higher than what, is, what we, we, we estimate for China, not as much as, uh, as, uh, as the US, but nevertheless it's actually um, a, a success story in that respect. Um, more of the, a bit more of the challenges, um, Sorry, kind of, I, I wanted to show you the Corcovado because it's very nice, just to finish it. I don't know why it's stuck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one of the challenges, what we have seen up to now, uh, is through the global growth is going south, but not so south, not so much in Latin America. Latin America is actually one of the emerging markets which, which will grow less than other emerging areas of the world. Why is that? The reason it really has to do with the structural reform, to the structural impediment to economic growth, this is a, a, some data from our business environment rankings. The business environment ranking is a very successful product of the Economist Intelligence Unit, the index that assessed the attractiveness of the business environment of 82 countries in the world, looking at different aspects, uh, market opportunities, policy towards enterprises and FDI, foreign trade, infrastructure, education, uh, availability of talent, and so on and so forth. As you see, the change in the, in the um, in the, in the score, which is actually the measure of the absolute performance of the region with respect to the other region, uh, is quite disappointing because if you look at Latin America, it's actually the, the, the emerging area of the world which is going to, to do the least progress uh, towards a better uh, business environment. Um, it actually a very similar, its, it's progress is going to be very similar to the one of North America, which is an established market where, the, where obviously you, know, you, you don't expect so much dynamism in, in, in improving the, the business environment ranking. But with respect to Eastern Europe, for instance, or Asia, there's quite a big gap. The reason for that, among the most problematic areas to tackle, is really the poor infrastructure. 
Latin America um, is investing at the moment around 2% of GDP on average on infrastructure. Uh, this compared to 10% in China or 6% in India. And some study from the, from the ECLAC, from the Economic Commission uh, uh, for Latin America of the UN, found that for the region to be able to continue to grow, 5% um, of GDP have to be invested in infrastructure. So there is quite a big gap still to reach those levels. Labor markets are very rigid. Um, this is a problem overall, I mean, with the exception, exception of Chile probably. Um, across the region. Um, the fiscal system is another problem, it's a system which is uh, very much reliant on indirect taxes. Um, the tax revenue are very low as a potential percentage of GDP, under 20% 20, 20 compared to 34% in the OECD. Uh, there are problems of poor competition in most of the key markets, <laughs> red tape, availability of skilled labor, which is connected to the quality of the, of the education in the country. The country, unfortunately, con continues to perform among, the, the, among the, uh, the last in the PISA OECD assessment on, uh, on, um, on, on maths, science and reading. So there are plenty of, uh, of, uh, of issues to tackle in the region. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's, it's a region which has, shown, which has shown its resilience. And just to sum up the investment pros and cons, among the pros is the prudent fiscal and monetary policy, uh, the growing domestic market, which is in itself a success story, having investment in infrastructure, uh, therefore lots of opportunity in infrastructure for foreign investors, standard well functioning banking system. Uh, it's quite interesting because uh, if you look at the in Mexico for, for at the moment, the Spanish uh, banks uh, uh, which are investing in Mexico do, uh, last year have done most of the revenues in Mexico actually, because, so it's quite funny because it's like, oh, time is up. God, let me just finish this. Uh, a dynamic private sector and also the, what, what I was saying is deeper south-to-south -south trade and investment links. The cons, shortage of uh, skills and uh, connected to the to low level of education, the regional labor market, crime and corruption, I haven't really touched but remains a big problem in the region inefficient bureaucracy and underdevelopment infrastructure at the time. And with that, um, oh, that's quite interesting. I, that's my last slide as well. So <laughs> with respect to um, China and Latin America, the, the challenges, opportunities, the challenges, especially on the Latin American side, it's really the fact that so far, Latin America, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, running quite a big um, trade deficit with, uh, with, with China. And also the type of trade relationship between China and Latin America is not a south to south, it's more of a north to south pattern whereby China exports manufacturers and Latin America import commodity to, to China. So this is not very good. I mean, for China it's probably quite, quite, uh, quite okay, but for Latin America it's not very good. And really, there are, I think the effort is, has to be made for a, for a further trade diversification um, towards more value added products. And, uh, and this is something which could be quite positive also for, for China because it's also a way to develop really the, the joint initiative and business initiative to promote intra-industry trade and also opportunity for more cooperation in innovation and human capital, which is something that is important for, for both countries and both regions. And with that, I finish. If you have any other questions, I think I don't, we don't have time for questions, no? We do, okay. Any questions? The gentleman there. Hi. The question is about whether Latin America is uh, taking business away from China as far as the trade uh, with the U.S. is concerned. And uh, I understand the current administration in the U.S. is talking about uh, near-shoring, buying from somewhere near, nearby instead of uh, uh, the, uh, the China that's uh, far away. And uh, I wonder if, if, if you've seen any trend in that regard? Well, um, it's quite interesting because from my perspective, kind of, I'm kind of more uh, looking at the Latin American part. Actually, we have the opposite complaint from the Mexicans, say, oh, the, the Chinese are actually stealing all our market share in the US. What is true and what we have seen in the last few years is it's actually uh, Mexico is becoming and has the potential to become more of a competition for China because of what you mentioned, the, the, the closeness to, to, the, to the US, and also the fact that the labor costs are actually, now the, the, the margin between Chinese labor cost and, and Mexican labor cost has, sh has shrunk quite a lot, it's about 30%, I think. So, so yeah, I think there is definitely this, uh, this, uh, uh, this risk for China, and it's true that 
China and Mexico actually are very, simi very similar uh, industrial structures, so they do compete for the same, uh, for the same markets. It's quite, it's quite interesting to see that Mexico, in any case, is actually reaching out to, to China. Uh, um, President Peña Nieto has been recently to China to try and develop other form which in involve trades, but also trying to really um, uh, attract investment into Mexico. Uh, because also the Chinese, I guess, they can, they can use the, the proximity to the, to the U.S. market to serve those markets. So I think it's, there are lots of possibilities, but yeah, it's, they, they are definitely two countries which compete for the same markets and in the same products. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? When we talk uh, Latin America and China, so this means the backyard of the United States superpower. And right now, the, the United States is launching a very aggressive um, negotiation. It's called the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So do you think that, or what's your comments on about what kind of impact on um, China's access to Latin America since China, since Chile and some other Latin American member countries to join to the TPP? Thank you. I think it's a very promising initiative, and at the moment it's just the uh, Pacific uh, countries, uh, Mexico, um, uh, Colombia, Peru, and, uh, and, uh, and Chile. Um, this is going to be quite interesting because, again, it's going to put together in an in agreement which is going to be a next generation agreement, so supposedly going to be much more uh, uh, comprehensive in scope than you know, the traditional trade agreements, uh, country from Latin America and country from, uh, from Asia. Uh, this doesn't cover the, the country of south, those, the southern cone, especially Brazil. Brazil actually, is, if you look at Latin America in terms of trade policies, you have this kind of split between the Pacific and, uh, and Central American and uh, Caribbean, and the southern cone, which, is, uh, which, is, which are the, group, the countries or uh, groups around the Mercosur, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Venezuela now. All these countries are kind of more inward looking, kind of protecting more, well, with, with the exception of Uruguay, who kind of, kind of uh, uh, um, has to follow the bigger partner, but is not, is quite, is quite open. All those countries are, are more inward looking. And what is interesting, if you look at the, um, at the um, yes, if you look at the, um, uh, at the growth rate of this country, you see that the countries which have been more open, especially more open towards Asia, are the ones that are actually doing much better in terms of economic growth. So definitely, I think uh, uh, trade to in, the, in, the, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is going to increase and, and be beneficial for, for both sides of the, of, the, of the OCN. Thank you. 